Christ and an Umrah of the body. What happens sometimes is the focus is on the du'as to recite, the fit, the rulings, the airplane tickets, the visas. And what sometimes gets lost in that hustle and bustle is the spirituality of the heart. When you go for Umrah, it's not just a journey of the body, it's just as much a journey of the heart. And you can't go to Umrah and come back as the same person. You can't. And so, uh, when I, Alhamdulillah SWT, blessed me to be able to go for Hajj a few years ago, and also go to Umrah a few years ago, before COVID. And every year, I would go through the same process. I would listen to a couple of lectures, read a couple of articles. And I noticed that when it comes to the spirituality of the process of Umrah, it's always just mixed in. So there's three main things, logistics, fiqh, spirituality. Logistics, there's a lot of stuff online. The visa process, when to book, the hotels, the taxis, uh, get an unlock SIM, unlock phone. The fiqh, mashallah, has a lot of resources. But when it comes to spirituality, it's sometimes hard to find. So what I've done, essentially, is gone through uh, whatever resources I had and just collected the spirituality aspect, the deeper reflections of the different actions of Umrah, visiting Makkah and Medina. And so, uh, you know, this essentially is just a collection of gems from many shu'uf. Someone mentioned is uh, Imam Umar Suleiman, Sheikh Yasser Fadi, Dr. Fahan Abdul Aziz, Mufti Kamani, and Sheikh Nadeem Aziz. So inshallah, if you search Umrah, these are the people that come up. Uh, Umrah doesn't start when you land. Umrah starts when you make the intention. And just like there's a preparation process for Umrah, there's a preparation process for the heart. You start thinking about yourself, where you are in life, your sins. You start cutting back on, on TV and computers. You start focusing on dhikr. It's a preparation phase. And many times you think of how do you have the perfect Umrah? When you think of the perfect Umrah, many people think, well, how many things is that? There's the tawaf, there's the ikram, there's the sa'i, cutting up the hair, there's going to the masjid as much as you can. Usually it's about five or six items. I would like to present to have a perfect umrah is perfecting 52 items. It's a long list. And perfection means you don't have to be perfect, but the pursuit is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows we're human beings, we're not perfect, we can't be perfect. But the effort and the struggle is there. So just like you perfect the ihram, the tawaf, the sa'i, going to the masjid, you also perfect your wudu. How Rasulullah wudu. You perfect your salah, your khushu. You go through the tafasir, the last ten surahs of the Qur'an. You perfect your knowledge of the seerah, or the sunnah of the character of Rasulullah You perfect the adhkar of the morning and evening. You perfect the sunnah of listening to the adhan. You perfect the ability to give sadaqah and help others. There's so many things that you can do to perfect your ummah. And so uh, this pursuit is, is very in detail. So inshallah, you, know, you try your best to do as much as you can. The first thing we have to understand is that most people in the world overwhelming majority of the Muslims of the world will never see the Kaaba in person. They will never be able to take that journey. For those, many times there's a financial reason. They've been saving for 15, 20, 30 years of their life. And every year, the price goes up and they're farther and farther away. So financially, there's a barrier. Then there are people who have the money. They've saved up. But they don't have the ability, the status, the visa. The government isn't allowing them. Maybe they're a refugee. <coughs> so they have the money, but they don't have the ability legally to go. Then there are people who have the money, who have the visa, who have the passport, but they don't have the help. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't physically be able to manage it. So if you find yourself a person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to go visit Makkah and Medina, it is one of the greatest blessings you have in your life. And it's something that we ourselves have to understand and recognize and appreciate. 
Just like we recharge our phones constantly throughout the week, our iman needs to be recharged. This, uh, this idea of just leaving work and school and our community, just going as a traveler and refocusing our life is something we absolutely need in our day-to-day -day lives. And what's beautiful is when you go, you go actually go as a guest. Rasulullah says that the guests of Allah are three. Number one, it's the warrior who fights in jihad. Number two, it's the one who performs hajj. And number three is the one who performs Umrah. So if I invited you, if you got a letter in the mail to see someone, let's say a big speaker, you look up to, you listen to, you'd be really excited, he invited you to his house. Or let's say the president, you got invited to the White House. Any type of leader, you got invited, it's a big deal, it's an honor. So you're going as a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah called you and you accepted the, the call. And one understanding of one of the blessings of Umrah, of going to Makkah and Medina, is that it's the remover of sins. Rasulullah says, from one Umrah to the other Umrah is the expiation of sins. And between the two Umrahs, or the two Hajj, brings no reward, no reward less than paradise. And just like you have the ability to go to Umrah, that same blessing and reward you have in your daily day in Salah. Rasulullah says that in between the salah, it's an example like a river. Imagine you bathed in the river five times a day. Would you have any sin left on you? Would you have any dirt left on you? Just like that, the salah from one salah to another is an expiation of sins. And just like the jum'ah between the two jum'ah is an expiation of sins. And what's beautiful is when you go for Umrah, if you're ever gone, there's this sense of sakina. There's a sense of peace that you cannot describe. You get glimpses of it in Ramadan. You get glimpses of it if you wake up early in the morning for Hajj al Fajr. But that sense of sakina and peace, some scholars say, what is the reason for that? Because sins, they weigh you down. Sins bring discomfort and uneasiness into your life. They distance you from Allah. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes those sins, Remove the effects of those sins. Just a taste of that is what you experience when you go to Makkah Medina. When you go for Hajj or Umrah. That moment of Sakina. Now, when you think of the actual masjid going to Umrah, understand that not all times and locations are the same. Praying in Medina, two raka'a salah, is multiplied by a thousand times. Praying in Mecca, the Haram, multiplied by 100,000 times. Now these numbers are not meant for you to sit down and say, well, okay, if I calculate it, and I pray once, I'll be set for life. No, it's, it's talking about the significance. These numbers are there just, you're not able to physically wrap your head around it. But the importance and the, and the, the seriousness of, of where you are. Now, let's say, for example, some people here, you have your tickets booked. You have your Umrahs. Umrah accepted. That's no guarantee you're going to actually go. Even on the plane, you're on your way there, you're about to land, there's still no guarantee you're going to go and enter the masjid. Why? Because all the way to the very end, it's a tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like that is an example and representation of our lives. Abu Bakr who said that even if my one foot was in Jannah, I still wouldn't be at ease until my second foot goes in. This concept of always leaning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this sense of balance of fear and hope. Worrying and, and being worried that, you know what, was my salah accepted? Is my sin, are my sins like a boulder that's about to crush you? Is this going to ruin my life? And so, this idea, number one, of guidance in our lives, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever you find yourself doing khair or good, it's acknowledging Allah's blessing. And number two, realizing that it can, it is not a guarantee. It is not a guarantee. Can I just share something about the Hajj? Uh huh. Sure. If you pray five, five, one day, the five brother, five uh, prayers in Mecca, that means like you pray two hundred seventy-seven years and nine months. 
Can you imagine that? 277 years and nine months. That's how much you get with you. Uh, anytime you find yourself in the masjid, praying, fasting, reading Quran, or in Makkah or Medina, huge blessing. But just because you are, in a sense, close to Allah now, you're quote unquote religious now, that doesn't guarantee that's going to be the case at the end of your life. The entire Surah Al Fatiha can be summarized into one phrase. It's a dua for guidance. And you recite that in every single rak'ah, in every single salah, ahdina salat al mustaqim. Every single moment you're asking Allah, Oh Allah, guide me to the straight path and keep me on the straight path. Keep me on the straight path. And so, uh, the, when we find ourselves in that situation, you're going, it's, accept, it's, a, 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 it's acknowledgement, appreciation of Allah, and it's a realization that you won't always be there. <coughs> Number two, when you go for Umrah, it is a preparation of death. Just like Hajj, you pay off your loans, you ask for forgiveness, you take care of all your affairs. If I don't, you're, you're anticipating not returning. You know, before the advent of airplanes and the internet and technology, people when they went for Umrah or Hajj, it would take them years to get to where they need to be. The family, in their minds, this is the last time they're going to see them. It was a very, very serious journey, and the, it was a dangerous journey. So they would make sure everything is done, everything is resolved. Their will is there. And so just like us, you're asking for forgiveness, you're saying your goodbyes, and you're taking those two pieces of cloth, the ihram, that you're going to be buried in. You came into this world with nothing, and you're going to leave this world with nothing. So what are the so many things we focus on? How much of our life did we spend on a degree? How much of our life did we spend working for our finances, our savings, our investments? <coughs> How much did we spend on our families? Which is important, it's an obligation, but I'm talking about the priority. At the end of it, as soon as you see the angel of death, all of it, your money is going to be distributed. No one's going to care what degree, what college you graduated from. Your family will miss you, but even that is eventually is going to go away and the world would function, and you're going to be by yourself in the grave. And the only thing that's going to be with you is your deeds. Your good deeds and your sins. And so, all of us have somebody we have a problem with. All of us have somebody that we have an argument with, somebody we don't really mesh with, somebody we, you know, friction with. Those are the people especially you got to call, and you got to apologize, you got to say sorry. You gotta give them a gift. Even though, even though you were right, that person was wrong. Those are the people you gotta go before you go to Umrah and ask for forgiveness. Rasulullah so says, I guarantee a house on the outskirts of paradise, a house in the middle of paradise, and a house in the highest part of paradise, for one who gives up arguing, even if he is right. Who gives up lying, even if he's joking, and who makes his character excellent. So, for forgiving others, Mending things right, making sure your parents are happy, mending ties with your family members, your siblings, your cousins, somebody that just fell off. You stop talking to them for some reason. Why? You have to understand something. Whenever you go to a janaza to somebody you know, somebody you've met with, there was a point where it was your last conversation with that person that you didn't even realize it. Every janaza that you know the person, it could be a relative, it could be a family member, there was a point where that was your last interaction with that person. And the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the last interaction you're going to have with people? What are they going to remember you about? Was it the stuff you argued about? They might have said you stole something, you did something, you said something, and you had an argument, agreement. That's the last memory that they'll have of you. And maybe something that you did to them that they're holding a grudge. And on the day of judgment, they want to come and, and, and repay. You're, they're going to take your good deeds for that grudge. For many times, it's not worth it. So this preparation of going. And then the first thing you start thinking about is what is the etiquette of traveling? There's sunnahs of Rasulullah about traveling. You pray two rakat salah, you make dua to Allah for safety. And there's long duas. There's a short dua when you get in the car, when you go. But then there's longer duas. We should print those duas before we go to Umrah or Hajj. 
you should appoint an emir, somebody, the sunnah, that one person is going to be in charge of making the decisions, somebody knowledgeable. If you can, try your start, to start your journey on a Thursday. I mean, obviously, if the flight is two, three thousand dollars different, that's different. But if you have two days and they're both the same price, try to go on a Thursday. Just for the intention of, Rasulullah says something did this and I'm going to do this. And make lots of du'a. You'll notice in the entire process of Hajj al-Umrah, it's all about du'a. Rasulullah s.a.w. tells us that the hadith of three people are accepted. Look at these words, are accepted. The du'a of a parent for the child, the du'a of a traveler, and the du'a of the oppressed. Now why? Look at the common denominator of these things. All three of these categories have to do with the heart. The love of a parent and a child. The distress of a traveler being leaving from their house of comfort and being in places they don't know, with people they don't know. And the pain and the tears of, a, of someone who is oppressed. All these situations is a perfect opportunity where you make dua and Allah will give you what you want. So make a list a week, two, three weeks before you should be having a notebook. Everything that's bothering you. Everything you're worried about, you're scared of. For your kids, for your spouse, for your parents. Everything that's giving you anxiety, everything you want in this life. It could even be material possessions, it doesn't matter. That long list of things you want to love Allah. And this idea that when you go and you ask Allah, Allah is inviting you. You're a guest of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to those who ask <coughs> Now, third concept. There's one activity you can do is, imagine you made a circle. You made a circle on a poster board. It's not like that. <laughs> and in that circle, you put things that, that annoy you, but you can handle it. So things that bother you, but you're, you can handle it. It's not a big deal. Okay? That's one inside the circle. Uh, out the, and make another circle outside of that. Things that really annoy you, get on your nerves and you struggle with it. Like you really have to fight it. So let's say for example, you're, you're, uh, you're a clean freak. You're, you're a germaphobe. Like it really bothers you. Or let's say for example, uh, you're claustrophobic, you don't like being squeezed. So the first circle is things that bother you, you can handle it. The second circle is things that you have to struggle. Then there's a third circle, things that you cannot handle. It just, it is, your, it is the thing that you lose it. Guaranteed, when you go for Hajj or that's what's going to be tested with. That's what you're going to be tested with. Why? It is, it is, the, it is the training program for cleansing your heart. There's two things you have to have supper with. With people and situation. With people and situation. Who, who can push your buttons the most? It's your family members. It's your spouse. It's your kids. It's your in-laws. And there's a reason for that. Because that, that's what's hard. It's, it's being able to be patient. Now when you're going on, let's say for example, you're going and people are pushing you. People are shoving you. you have, uh, you're waiting in line for Salah. You've been there for an hour. Somebody comes and steals your spot. Okay? There's crowds of people and no one's wearing deodorant. It's a test. But you have to understand something that there's a reason for that. And mentally prepare for that. And have that expectation. Because in that patience, in that sacrifice, could be your acceptance of Allah. In that very deep. One of the tips that uh, some people give is that let's say you're on Umrah and somebody's doing something to you. Pushing you, shoving you, elbowing you. Don't look at their face. Just don't turn up. Because once you have a face, it's much more easier to get angry at that person. And when you're in those crowds, you are, are reminding yourself that all these people are guests of Allah. And you make dua to Allah, Oh Allah, just like this crowd is here, Oh Allah, allow me to be of the crowds of people who enter Jannah. It's all part of the process. In, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Hajj. And again, I, I mentioned Hajj and Umrah because they're interchangeable. To do Hajj, you have to do Umrah. Allah SWT talks about Hajj and then He mentions <coughs> That 
whatever good you do, whatever good you do, realize Allah knows of it. And the best provision you can take with you on your journey is a provision of taqwa. So, you know, sometimes at work you do things and your boss doesn't realize it. He doesn't really don't, don't notice it at all. Sometimes you do things for your spouse or your kids and they don't notice it, they don't appreciate it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every single struggle that you go through. Allah knows every single sacrifice you make. <coughs> Everything you do for that other person next to you on the train, or someone at the masjid, or the, the worker at the haram, Allah knows every single aspect of it. And then Allah says the best provision, more important than your passport, more important than your cell phone, more important than your accommodation is the taqwa you take with you. The entire purpose of Ramadan is for you to establish taqwa, this consciousness of Allah. And the entire focus and of, of going to Makkah and Medina is to also develop this idea that Allah is watching. Allah is seeing what I do. And, and, and you know, when a parent, if you're, if you're about to commit a sin and a parent walks in the room, you feel shame, you feel shy. You don't want to upset or, or you want to get the parents upset. So it stops you from doing it. And so you're traveling, you're, you're in Ihram, you're traveling, and now is the time for Ihram. There's that special moment, you put on the Ihram. You, you take a shower, you cut your nails, uh, you, you, know, you shave your armpits, you shave all the, uh, of the hair. And then as you pray, you put on the Ihram, you pray to Rukat Nafa Salah, it's a very special to Rukat Nafa Salah. You know, you, you can put perfume on before, not after, but before you put it on. And this to Rukat Nafa Salah is a very important moment when you make dua to Allah for sincerity and accepting the Umrah. And make du'as that are comprehensive. One beautiful du'a Rasulullah said, O oh Allah, I ask you for all the good that the Prophet asked. And I seek refuge from all the evil that the Prophet sought after. And there is no, no power other than you. Many du'as. And when you put on the ihram, it removes all your distinctions. You're wealthy, you, you wear nice clothes. When you shave your head, it removes your image. A lot of times we focus on how we look, yeah. what other people think. Yeah. And so, yeah. after doing the ihram, you put on and you start saying the talbiyah. Yeah. The bait, Allahumma the bait, the bait, la sharika laka, the bait, inna alhamda wa na'amda wa na'amda la sharika laka. It's one of the best things you can say in ihram. Yeah. And one of the deeper meanings to understand is saying, Ya Allah, I've accepted your invitation, I'm here. Ya Allah, I'm present. I've left everything behind me. All the other things that I've heard, I'm here. Sometimes what happens is we're on autopilot. Splashing the water, praying our salah, doing the Ramadan, the fast, it's just automatic, like a cultural thing. But to intentionally be present is so important. One of the tricks of shaitan is to constantly keep you distracted. Get you involved in small little things. And so on a daily basis, on a weekly, on a daily basis, we have our salah to refocus us. We have, on a weekly basis, we have the Jum'ah to refocus us. On a yearly basis, we have Ramadan to refocus us. And then once, twice, three, sometimes in our life, we have Umrah and Hajj to refocus us. Constantly Allah giving us chances. If you mess up, there's another chance. If you mess up, there's another chance. It's a divine schedule to, come, to connect with us. Now, in this Talbiyah, what is the prominent theme in the Talbiyah? La Sharika. None worthy of worship except you. You know, we don't really realize that sometimes we think if you took a stone and you started worshiping it, Astaghfirullah, Shirk, A'udhu Billah. But in modern day society, we have different types of ilah that we worship. We don't even realize. What does worship mean? Worship means to submit, to obey. Worship means to trust. Worship means to love unconditionally. So for example, you sleep at night, you wake up with Fajr Adhan comes up, your alarm clock goes off and you hit the alarm. You have a decision to make. Do you worship Allah and you get up and you make wudu? Or do you worship and obey your desires, your nafs, the shaitan? It's a scary concept. Because in that moment you make a decision, you know what? I'm going to worship my, and obey and submit to my, my desires and shaitan. Let's say for example, you get a raise, you get a bonus. And all of a sudden, a, a big influx of money comes into your bank account. Does that money make you feel more secure? Make you feel like, you know what, I'm safer, I'm in a better place now? 
Because that safety and trust you're putting is more on the money or is it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This concept of understanding. Let's say for example, you uh, need something really badly at work or with your family situation and there's a really powerful person, really powerful person who knows a lot of connection. And you think to yourself, you know what, if I talk to this person, he'll take care of everything. You're actually putting your trust in that person. And so when it comes to la sharika, when it comes to submitting, you are putting all these other things on the side, your money, your status, your relationships, your desires on the side, and you're saying, La Sharika, only Ya Allah, only I'm submitting to you, and no one else. When you are walking in Medina and Makkah, I want you to think about this for a second. You are walking in a place that the Sahaba used to walk, the Prophets used to walk. And can you imagine you step foot on a, on a piece of land where Rasulullah's foot put? He stepped on that, Rasulullah was on that space, and your foot stepped on it. The beauty and the situation of walking in the process of Rasulullah sometimes the Sahaba would be walking and they would bend over sometimes. Just kind of bend over and walk, and someone asked what happened. And he said, there used to be a tree here. And Rasulullah bent down to get under the branch, and I'm doing the same one. This conviction and focus on what Rasulullah did. And when you think of Makkah, when you think of the Kaaba, there should be one person you should be thinking about. And that is Ibrahim alayhi salam. You need to have a strong connection with this person's life. The best nights of the year are the last two nights of Ramadan. The best days of the year are the ten days of the Hijjah. And within the ten days of the Hijjah is the act of Hajj, it's the days of Hajj. And if you look, the entire Hajj is designed to remember what Ibrahim alayhi salam did. It's a summary of Ibrahim alayhi salam's submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single salah we mention Ibrahim alayhi salam's name. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ibrahim in It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And if you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi he came to perfect and establish the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Test after test after test, Ibrahim alayhi salam was tested. And at the end of this test, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعَلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted Ibrahim alayhi salam, made him an imam and role model for mankind. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was building the Kaaba with Ismail alayhi salam, father and son, building the Kaaba with rocks, what were they saying? رَبَّنَا تُقَبِّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ سَمِّرَانِ Oh Allah, accept this from us. Who's building this Kaaba? The best people on earth were the prophets. What are they doing? They're building the house of Allah, the Kaaba. Forget about visiting the Kaaba. They're building the Kaaba. Even then they're worried about what? Ya Allah, please accept. This, this constant concern. Ya Allah, please accept. Whenever we pray Salah, whenever we do anything, we are nowhere near how it should be done. And so afterwards we ask Allah, Ya Allah, there were so many mistakes in this. Ya Allah, I didn't do how I was supposed to. Ya Allah, please accept. After building it, Ibrahim al Salam built the Kaaba, he noticed that all the sides were very similar. It was a rectangle, but you wouldn't know where you started, where you ended. So he told Ismail Salam to go find a rock. Find a rock that's different from the other rocks. Ismail Salam was tired, exhausted. He said, you know, he was kind of hesitant. Ibrahim al Salam said, get up and go, go find another rock. So he went to look for the rock, and he couldn't find it, and he came back and he saw Ibrahim al Salam holding a shining white rock. And he asked his father, where did he get this rock from? And he said that I got it from someone who doesn't get tired like you and me. It was Jibreel a.s. who brought this rock from the heavens. When, when the Hajar al-Aswad, the, the, the stone, came down, it was white. And Rasulullah s.a.w. tells us that because of the sins of mankind, it became black. So the black stone was actually white before. And it just shows you that there's an actual physical impact of a person who sins. Sins have a physical impact in our lives. And so the Kaaba was rebuilt. The Kaaba was, uh, there's different narrations. There was a big flood that came down. So uh, another narration is someone was putting perfume on the Kaaba and it, and, and it caught on fire. Different narrations. What was beautiful is that if you go to the Kaaba and, you, and you're doing tawaf, there's two specific sides that are very special. So also some used to go to those sides. You should touch those. You do Rukun Yamani and the Hajj al So where the black stone is and Rukun Yamani. Why are those two, two sides so special? 
of the Kaaba because those two sides were the original two sides of the Kaaba. The other side that was built and destroyed and rebuilt again, those were done later on, but the original two sides were the Rukhni Yaman and Hajar Aswad, those two sides. And they were so keen at that time that even they, when they wanted to rebuild the Kaaba, they didn't want to use Haram money. At that time, there was a lot of gambling, a lot of uh, 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 prostitution, indecency at that time. A lot of problems in society at that time, but they still knew the devastating effects of Haram money on a person's life. And they barely got together some, a little bit of money and they were able to rebuild the Kaaba, but it shows us the lessons of the importance of halal, of halal money and of the devastating effects of halal money. And so you now wore the ihram, you're doing tawaf now. When you do tawaf, how do you control the speed of your tawaf? You don't. The ummah controls the speed of the tawaf. You're just following the ummah. It's a lesson for us, number one. Just like you don't decide your family, you don't decide the community you live in, and you don't decide the ummah you're assigned to. Every single person there, you have a responsibility in a greater sense. Every person in this masjid, in your local community, you have a responsibility to them. And every person in your family, all the distant relatives, cousins and aunts and uncles and in-laws, you have a responsibility to them. Allah SWT has assigned them to you for a reason. So this is a reminder of your connection to the ummah all over the world. Every single billions of people praying towards the Kaaba. And the adhan goes off in one time zone, as soon as it ends, it starts in another time zone. And so the adhan and the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance is going across the globe every single day continuously. Number two, when you do a tawaf, it's a reminder that the tawaf, the Kaaba, is in the center just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a priority in your life. He's in the center of your life. This, this, it's very easy to say, but on a daily, weekly basis, when you're thinking about your plans, what, you're, what are you worrying about? What did you worry about today? Or this week? So this idea of keeping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the center of your life. Another reflection of tawaf. You know out of all the tawaf, the four sides of the Kaaba, three fourths of the tawaf, there's no specific dua you should, that's recommended to recite. You can do dhikr, you can make dua, you can recite Quran. The only time that there's a recommended sunnah is the last part of the tawaf between Rukun Yamani and Hajar Aswad, where you're supposed to say the beautiful dua in Surah Al-Baqarah, Rabbana adina fi dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa ta'aradana. Beautiful dua we should be reciting every single day. The Prophet told us the beautiful dua, the most comprehensive. Oh Allah, give us the best of this life and the best of the akhirah. Amazing dua. But look at this. Just the last fourth is a reflection of Islam in whole. There's a lot of flexibility in our deen. A lot of flexibility. Allah SWT said, eat whatever you want. Just these few things don't do. Do whatever you want throughout the day. Just these few minutes of the day, praise the Salah. Earn as much as you want, however money as you want. Spend what just this small percentage gives to the zakat and charity. Out of the entire year, just fast for these few days. You know, sometimes we say, man, it's so much work. Everything is haram. Oh, I gotta pray. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. This, and it, when reality is the other way around, there's only a few things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks from us. And there's so much flexibility. And so you do the tawaf, and then what is the next step? You drink the zamzam. Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala to drink the zamzam. Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of zamzam. It's very important that we understand this. Where Ibrahim salam was commanded to go with Hajar salam and Ismail. And you have to understand something. Ibrahim salam never asked anything of this dunya. He always asked for the akhirah, except for one thing. What did he ask for? He asked for his son. Out of anything, he just, at an old age, he really, really wanted one thing, and that was his son. And he was blessed with Ismail salam. And the very one thing that he asked for was the very one thing he was tested with throughout his life. Ibrahim A.S. was tested with, he fought against the idols and they threw him into a big burning fire. Ibrahim A.S. was saved, he trusted Allah in that moment. 
he was asked to sacrifice his son. And he was tested, and, and, and Ibrahim and Ismail was, was removed, and uh, a goat was put in place, a sheep was put in place, and he passed that test. And in this situation, he was asked to take Hajar and Ismail to the middle of the desert, and to leave them there. Now you have to understand, Ibrahim was a prophet, but he was a husband. He was a father. It was very, very difficult for him, but he, he, so even when he went, when he went there, he sat down and he got up and he was about to leave. And Hajar didn't know what was going on. And uh, uh, she asked him, she asked him, what, you know, uh, are you just leaving us here in the desert? And he was silent. Why? Because he knew if he started to have a conversation with her, he wouldn't know if his heart could handle it. He was struggling, but he trusted Allah. It didn't make sense to him, maybe, but he knew it was the best. And then Hajar a.s. She realized, she said, is this, is this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Zafar. And he said, yes. And then she said, you know what? I'm being removed from the, your, you were, you're my caretaker, but now Allah is my caretaker. This trust and conviction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we all know the story. Uh, the, the hadith is that when she was running between the two, the Prophet said, فَإِذَا هِيَا بِسَوْتِ All of a sudden they hear a sound. And Jibreel is salam, he struck the ground like this. And this is a hadith al musalsal meaning whenever someone narrates this, they actually do the movement. Jibreel struck the ground. And so all the narrated, Ibn Abbas they, they said when they narrated the hadith, he struck the ground. Shu'aba said, he struck the ground. Every single narrator said, Jibreel struck the ground and the water started coming out of the ground. And Rasulullah said, Rahimahullah, uh, uh, um Ismail, may Allah have mercy on Ismail, the mother of Ismail, she started to carve out the well. The water was coming. And she was worried that it would go away, so she started carving it with her hand. And Rasulullah said that had she not done that, the Zamzam water, that earth, the entire earth would be touched with that water. It would have flooded the entire earth. If you ever look at Zamzam, the well of Zamzam is 8 by 3 feet. It's a very small well. And you look, containers and containers are being filled up non-stop in the haram, constantly being filled up. And when you drink, when you drink the zamzam, you are drinking from the heel of Jibreel. And they did a study, they actually did, a, 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 they measured the flow of the water of zamzam, and they found that it pumps over 8,000 liters a second. 8,000 liters a second, over 691 million liters per day. Non-stop. Since that time up till now, it has never been dried up. Millions of people have drunk from it. And so when you're drinking that zamzam, you're thinking to yourself, it's a miracle of Allah, but also understanding that it is the trust of Hajj a.s. Can you imagine the, the feeling of a parent who's worried about their child, about their safety, about their food? Hajj a.s. didn't just make dua. Didn't just, just trust Allah, she ran between Safa and Marwa. And so that after you drink Zandra, you go to Safa and Marwa, and you think to yourself, you're running between them. Some scholars say, as if you're running between the scales on the Day of Judgment, between your good deeds and your bad deeds, and you're worried, and you're, and you're, and you're scared. What's going to be the outcome? But she, alayhi salam, still did the work. Musa, alayhi salam, when he was stuck between the army behind him and the, and the sea in front of him,